So I'd like to start with a quote uh, by Albert Einstein. The world as we have created it is, is a process of our thinking. So to change the world as we know it, we have to change our thinking. So what, what does this mean to me? This says to me that um, if you want to make big leaps, you want to do revolutionary science as a scientist, um, you really need to be able to think outside the box sometimes. So I'm going to tell you about regenerative medicine today, but I'd like to start with a couple of scenarios. First, imagine your soldier. You're injured on the battlefield. Battlefield medic saves your life. They take you back to the States, get you to a hospital. Surgeon comes to you and says, I can save your mangled legs because you were injured on the battlefield. I can save your mangled legs. However, it's going to take dozens of surgeries and months of painful rehabilitation, but I can't guarantee that you'll get full function back. Or we can take the leg and give you a prosthetic. This is a true scenario, and I can tell you a lot of soldiers automatically say, just take the legs, right? I, I don't want to undergo all of the surgeries and the painful physical therapy to not, not be sure that I'm going to be able to walk or run do the other things that I've done previously in my life. Second scenario, you're a diabetic. Um, you've been on dialysis because your kidneys are starting to fail. Um, your doctor says, I need to put you on a transplant list. None of your family members are a match. They can't donate a kidney for you. Uh, so we're going to put you on a list. And basically, you're going to have to wait for someone to die for us to save your life, right? To find an appropriate donor. Um, the truth of the matter is, patients on a transplant list, whether it's for a kidney or a heart or any other organ, you have a much greater chance of dying while waiting than actually getting an organ. Regenerative medicine has the potential of addressing both of these problems. Regenerative medicine also has the potential of dealing with more uh, common injuries, maladies, birth defects, uh, injuries, genetic defects, diseases, some of what you see back on the screen. I'm a scientist at the Wake Forest Institute of, Re of Regenerative Medicine. I'm a trained cell biologist, so I do basic research, which means I work on cells and animals. I'm not a clinician. Most of my patients have four legs, so, and they're small. <laughs> But my dream and my goal with my research is to be able to address some of these other issues. Um, not that transplantations aren't important, but I, there are other issues that can be addressed by regenerative medicine that are probably more common to you and I. So my research actually focuses on skeletal muscle. I work with skeletal muscle. Uh, skeletal muscle is the tissue in our body that allows us to move. We contract, uh, we walk, we move. That's all skeletal muscle. As we get older, our skeletal muscle doesn't work as well. And so my scientific research is based on understanding how our muscle function changes as we get older and how we heal after injury as we get older. That leads me to aging. So the definition of aging is a decline in the biological functions as we get older. Basically, what that means is that our bodies don't work as well, right, as we start to get older. We don't heal as fast. I am sure a lot of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, getting up in the morning takes a little bit more time. Um, I can tell you for myself that coming down these steps, <laughs> I had to hold on to the handrail and really watch my feet. because <laughs> I'm finding that going down steps is actually harder than going up these days. You know. Suddenly, we don't see as well, we need bifocals. Um, men, men lose their hair. Women, women grow hair where we don't want it as we get older, right? So all of these things. Um, 
Now, I really want to talk about uh, women as we go, get older. Uh, we face that dreaded time, that change of life. So, and yeah, I'm talking about menopause. Um, menopause is often associated with hot flashes, right? Uh, redistribution of weight, uh, mood changes. Um, but that, that period of time in the life when, that, when all those things are happening is really called the menopausal transition. And it goes from the time of child rearing age when that starts to decline to one year uh, after the last menses. And that can last up to 10 years for women. And this is really a, a particular um, sensitive time for women when it comes to diseases. Now men also undergo hormonal changes as they get older, but as a middle-aged woman myself, menopause is personal, oh, I can tell you. Uh, so once women reach the postmenopausal state, there's increase in heart disease, cardiovascular disease, uh, increased in osteoporosis, which is bone loss, which uh, uh, makes women more prone to breaks as they get older, uh, increased hypertension, and we have a greater loss of muscle function and mass over time. So, so this is an important period of time um, for men and women as we get older, because a loss a loss of skeletal muscle function and mass, which is also called sarcopenia, that leads to uh, lack of independence, right? Lack of mobility, can't get up and walk, uh, can't dress yourself, lack of independence, and really a decreased quality of life. And so my research is not really focused on making us all live to be 120, because that's not what I'm interested in, but I would really like to be able to spend the last years of my life you know, maybe playing with the grandkids, or great-grandkids, but hopefully not soon. Um, <laughs> I'm speaking to my children out there. <laughs> um, you know, uh, walking the beaches, you know, doing these last things, having a, being able to age gracefully for my last chapters. So what is regenerative medicine, and how does it fit into this whole idea of aging? The idea of tissue regeneration, so to regenerate, generate means to make new, or to make, regenerate is to remake, so regenerative medicine, we're talking about making new tissues and organs. This, this whole idea of tissue regeneration is not new. It's been around for a long time. This is Prometheus, and if you know your Greek mythology, Prometheus was a titan, he was a Greek god, and uh, he formed man out of clay. But he noticed that man was naked. We don't have fur. We don't have fangs or claws like some of the other animals. Uh, we can't fly. We don't run very fast. We don't climb well. Uh, we don't uh, swim well, which really left us at a disadvantage when it came to all the other creatures on the planet. So he gave us a fire. The problem with that is fire was not his to give. Fire belonged to Zeus, his big brother, um, which, you know, sibling rivalry, I guess, is on a whole other scale when you're a Greek god. Uh, Zeus tied him up to a rock or mountain, depending on which version you read, tied him up to a rock. Every day an eagle would come pluck out, pluck out his liver, and then every night it would regrow. So the the ancient Greeks understood that the liver has regenerative properties, and it does. Our liver is highly regenerative, probably the most regenerative tissue in our body. Uh, the reason for that, uh, we have to think about what the liver does for us. So the liver is our filter. Everything we put in our body, the drugs, the alcohol, the fast food, you know, all these things get filtered through our liver. All these things that are bad for the cells in our body. So the, the cells in the liver really take a beating, um, and so we've evolved to regenerate those, to regrow that part. Uh, there are other animals that have a highly regenerative potential, um, unlike us. Uh, one of those uh, being the axolotl. So it's the cute guy there on your left. Um, he's a salamander. 
And many of you may know already that if you cut the leg off a salamander, it'll grow back. It takes about 60 days, so a month, month and a half, two months, something like that. Not very long. If you imagine if I were to cut my arm off, right, if I didn't die first, and one of you knows how to put on a tourniquet to save my life, um, I might be lucky if there's a talented surgeon available that could sew my arm back on. It is certainly not going to grow back, ever, right? However, at one point during embryonic development, we did grow into us, right? The cells that make up my body came from a single fertilized egg, so fertilized one cell, which then developed into my limbs and my hair and my eyes and all my organs. So at one point, we were capable of doing that. We just can't do it now. Now, the axolotl was really the superhero of uh, the newts, the salamanders, because with the axolotl, it can regrow a leg, but it can also regrow almost all of its organs. So even, even the brain, if you take part of the brain of the axolotl, it'll grow back. Um, us, our brain has a very low regenerative capacity. So you injure your brain, you live with it. It's not going to come back. Uh, traumatic brain injury, for example, right? We hear about this with the football players all the time because they're running around hitting each other and the brain is doing this in the skull, right? It's kind of bouncing back and forth and it's fluid and they end up with traumatic brain injury. Can't do anything about that once it happens. We have no way of healing the brain at this point in time. But the axolotl can. Um, the second animal up here on the screen, the one in the middle, that's a hydra. Um, some of you may know what the hydra is, or you might have heard from mythology. You cut the head off of hydra, you get three back, right? Doesn't work exactly that way, but the hydra is pretty amazing. It is an animal, although well, it's very small. Um, it's a carnivore, so it catches things that float by. Um, the amazing thing about the hydra is that you can take, you can go almost down to single cells and those cells will regrow to become another hydra. Um, and why can't it do that? Well, the hydra has this interesting uh, property associated with it. It has what's called a scaffold. Um, and so the protein scaffold that the cells are sitting on, so the cells sit on this protein scaffold. If part of that scaffold is removed with the cells, the scaffold can tell the cells what they're supposed to do and kind of uh, reorganizes them so that they can form another animal, another hydra. The last creature I want to talk about is the planaria, the last one up here on the screen, the worm. Um, I'm a cell biologist, as you heard. I really like planaria. Um, yeah, seems kind of weird, doesn't it? Um, these are freshwater flatworms. They grow to be about an inch in size, so they're small, and you'll find them all over the world. So anywhere there's freshwater stream ponds, there's some kind of planaria there. Um, planaria, remember I said they're about an inch, right? They can be cut into more than 250 pieces, and you'll get 250 worms that are exactly the same. Um, now that, that was uh, discovered in, uh, I think it was the mid 1800s, right? So you can imagine the scientist who figured that out. He had to sit down and make little tiny cuts of the planaria and then draw them out every day, right, to see where they grew and how it grew back. But it can grow, if you cut, if you cut it in half, it'll grow two heads or two tails, depending on which end. Um, they're, they're incredible. So what do they have? Well, they're different than the hydra, whereas the hydra has a protein scaffold that tells them how to regenerate. The planaria are filled with stem cells and their cells, so that's why it's my favorite creature of all. Um, stem cells are the cells in our body that fix our injured tissue. Well, I think it can be argued that all the tissues in our body have a resident stem cell population. Uh, these are called adult stem cells, and they're vital, because if you injure yourself, they become activated, and then they repopulate, they grow, and then they differentiate into whatever tissue needs to be healed. So if we talk about skeletal muscle, right? 
the stem cells in the skeletal muscle are called satellite cells. Satellite cells sit right there on the muscle. They don't do anything until they get a signal that the muscle's been injured. Um, those satellite cells then become active, they migrate to the area of injury, they differentiate and heal the muscle. So most tissues in our body have this. The brain, it's, it's disputed. I wouldn't say that, that, uh, that, the, that we know 100% whether the brain has stem cells. It might, it might. Uh, we know there are neural stem cells for neurons, um, but the brain doesn't heal. Um, the heart, the heart does have stem cells. They're called cardiomyocytes, uh, but they don't grow very well. And so when we talk about aging and skeletal muscle, it's been shown that the stem cells in the skeletal muscle, uh, they don't grow as well either as we get older, and they start to disappear. So we lose the numbers, and they don't work as well, which is why when you injure yourself, once you get older, it takes a lot longer to heal. And so with that being said, imagine the possibilities that regenerative medicine could bring into this. So if you need a knee replacement, instead of getting the metal put into the knee, right, what if we could inject cells that would help reform the bone, regrow, regrow the lost cartilage, right, to heal the bone, to heal that joint? Um, what about the soldier we talked about in the beginning? What if they lose their leg? But this is a little fantastical maybe right now. What if you injected them with cells and growth factors, biological factors, that told that leg, turned on that growth process, and the leg was able to grow back? The salamander does it. And as I said before, we did it during embryonic development. So the programming is there. We just have to figure it out. Now, I can't tell you that this is going to happen soon, or even really within our lifetimes, but these things are going to happen. Um, some of them are already happening, some of it's already in the clinic. So, thank you. Thank you.